Thank you, Phil. And thank you, everybody who is here uh, in our audience and uh, all those who are watching us streaming and anyone who's going to get a chance to watch this uh, on the recorded version uh, in a few weeks. Um, I was going to uh, actually start out saying you might be wondering who I am and you know, what am I doing here, but I think that's been explained. I'm, I'm Harry Agris, and my dad was Harry Agris Sr. And um, I think the more uh, interesting, let me get to before we even start, uh, I would like to put out thank yous to everyone who made this possible over a long period of time. Emma Bayless, Betsy Dennis, Phil Skorska, who just spoke, Mary Hendricks, who introduced us, Cindy Schoss, Gabby Deutzel, Allie Randall, James Kingsley, uh, my grandson and audio expert, and the foundation of Barnes Jewish Hospital and its leadership. Uh, Dr. John Lynch, who is president of Barnes Jewish Hospital. And uh, Katie Henderson, who is the chief medical officer, who uh, stood up for us before. Thank you all for coming. So how did this talk come about? You've heard a little bit about it, but the, 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 the biggest thing, the most craziest thing, is this was completely serendipitous that this whole thing happened. And it happened because my sister Nancy, who is sitting right here, wanted to get some info on me, and so she asked Google. And in the process of asking Google, she came across an audio interview of Harry Agris, MD, in the Becker Library, and it included his tour of duty with the 21st General Hospital during World War II from 42 to 45. Um, th this was a complete and total surprise. We, we, had, we certainly didn't know about the interview. He almost never, ever talked about the war, except in somewhat romantic uh, you know, phrasing and discussing, he would say, oh, that we were near Burgundy and the wine was great and some of the music was great, <laughs> you know, but never, ever any of the details of, and, and we had no real idea of what he was really dealing with. So I decided to do a little more digging and uh, I was frankly awestruck with what I discovered. So what I would like to do now is take you all on a journey. I want to give you some perspective on what was the 21st General Hospital and what role did they play in World War II from the viewpoint of both the archives in the Becker Library and information from one very involved soldier. How did these individuals handle this incredibly sudden change in their life where they were doing fine and they were in St. Louis and then all of a sudden everything changed? Uh, they also, once they got there, were dealing with extraordinary difficult circumstances, which we will get into. Everything changed December 7th on D-Day. The next day, FDR declared war on Japan. A few days later, the United States declared war on Germany. So I want you to imagine yourself now in St. Louis at this time, and there you are at Barnes or Jewish Hospital, working, minding your own business, looking out over Bucolic Forest Park and the beautiful trees and the water. And then all of a sudden, this thing comes in the mail. Uncle Sam wants you. So for you who may not know what this is, this is the recruiting poster for both World War I and World War II. The activation orders for the 21st General Hospital came in in January of 42 with 28 officers, 65 nurses, 105 enlisted men, all of whom were Barnes and Jewish Hospital and Washington U School of Medicine. There was certainly a change in uniform. Here you can see the nurses in their bright whites as they went to graduation and then changed into military uniforms shortly thereafter. The leadership was Commander Lee D. Cady and the nurse, Army Nursing Corps Chief was Lieutenant Lucille Spaulding. In January, they all went down to Fort Benning, Georgia and had 10 months of medical military training. They certainly had the medical part, but there's a whole strategic aspect to it and they had to have some some military training as well. In November, they headed out over the Atlantic on the SS Mariposa. 
Uh, they had to take a somewhat circuitous route because it was known that there were German subs in the region and they had absolutely no escort protection with them. And my dad will comment on this later in the talk. They arrived in Liverpool, England. Unfortunately, no one had been hurt. However, when they got there, they found out that the supplies for the 21st General Hospital had been distributed to other medical units. Imagine, you do all of this, you get there, and they don't have what you need to do your job. They still sailed from there, went to North Africa, joining the Allied offense in the Operation Torch, where they landed in Algeria in December. They were given orders to create a hospital out of an old spa building whose structures had been bombed out. It was a horrible, horrible rain, terrible storm, mud everywhere, and they were supposed to build this hospital and create something amazing. Well, the first thing they did was simple housekeeping. They had to clean things, lay down new piping, sewage lines. They had to really, like, redo this entire building. And amazingly, in two weeks, they saw their first patient. This is January. Four weeks later, they were up to 472 beds, starting with nothing. And they rapidly treated 1,000 patients including wounded civilians, in addition to soldiers and POWs. So they became the hospital for the whole area. And one year in North Africa, after one year, how many beds do you think they had? Any guesses from anybody? The number is insane. 4,000 beds in one year. And their staff was not increased dramatically. People have asked me how many doctors and nurses were there. I have not been able to find that, despite looking and looking and looking. But you saw the small numbers that they started out with. But I can tell you this, they certainly did not have enough. And things just kept flying in there. And in comparison, I can give you this. In 2023, Barnes Jewish Hospital had a bed census of 1,300. And they're dealing with 4,000. And these are super sick people. You know, and this isn't just like someone who falls off a bike and, and fractures their ankle. You know, these are very complex medical situations. They treated 21,000 people that year. And this is like in, in the middle of Africa. I mean, this was, this was not in a city. This was like in the middle of a desert. Um, I show this picture. This is uh, one of the um, surgeons, uh, Captain Russell J. Kreider, MD, who is orthopedic surgeon with the 21st. And I show it to you for two reasons. Uh, one is to show you how young these guys look. The men and women were very, very young. And I show it to you for another reason, because he's Jay Marshall's uncle. And Jay Marshall is one of my classmates and long friends. And he's sitting right back there. <laughs> Thank you for showing up, Jay. And he supplied me with these wonderful slides. Um, my dad was a hematologist, as we talked about. And he had a lot of lab experience. And they asked him to set up the blood bank. And uh, they said, but you know, of course, there will be two blood banks. And he said, well, what do you mean two blood banks? And they said, one white and one black. And he said, well, then I won't be a part of it. And he said, one blood bank or nothing. And they wanted him. So they agreed, and they acquiesced. And that changed the way the blood banks were done forever in that part of the, in the military. The paid donors, uh, the donors were paid with whiskey shots, which they either took immediately on the spot or sold to somebody else. And here's a picture of Dad over here showing some people at the lab, lab technicians about uh, issues with the blood bank. And then here you can see him looking through his uh, uh, microscope, which was one of his favorite things. So one of the big advances that were made had to do with blood transfusions. And initially, uh, the transfusions were limited to immediately before uh, surgery was performed. And many of these patients did not fare well. And he felt differently, and some other people felt differently. And they tried something completely new. And they started transfusing patients for 48 hours prior to the surgery. So hold off the surgery a little bit, and let's prime these people up. Let's give them, let's give them transfusions during the surgery. And if we could do it on the battlefield, go ahead and you know, prime them up before they even get into the hospital. And this produced dramatically improved results uh, for these surgical patients. Um, for example, they started out in North Africa with uh, 213 transfusions the first year. And then, over the next year, 
they went to 9,800 transfusions. So one year they went 50 times what they were doing before and saved many, many lives of post-operative uh, situations uh, by doing that. And just to give you an idea, 9,800 transfusions is the equivalent of what a major St. Louis hospital would use at that time in 25 to 30 years. And ultimately, this became the uh, standard in the United States. Uh, there were other important surgical innovations, the first decortication of lung uh, by Major Tom Burford. And I have to assume that we knew someone growing up, we knew Burfords, and I assume this is their dad. This is, in case you're wondering what decortication is, it's a surgical treatment for lung infections that occur after you've had some serious chest injury uh, because of the war. Uh, new techniques involving skull plates and nerve sutures were developed by renowned neurosurgeon Henry Schwartz, who uh, was really a worldwide uh, known figure. Um, and you know, this is all, all these people were Washington U and, and Jewish and Barnes. And which just brings up the point that not only were these guys, men and women, working incredibly hard, it was a very academic group of people. These were very, very advanced surgeons and nurses, and they were using whatever they had on all the troops that came in. Uh, new methods were also devised in orthopedics and plastic surgery. There were major efforts to boost morale in Algeria. As I said, they were in an old spa, and the chefs were still there, so they were able to get better meals than the usual army chow for the troops. They had a beautiful uh, roof garden, according to my dad's notes, and they had dances, and even the nurses went, sent home uh, to get party dresses. Festivals were arranged for the native villagers, and then some wonderful relationships developed, such as that between a Red Cross nurse and a neurosurgeon. Polly Billington and Dr. George Rulak were married on October 2nd in 1984 in Algeria. Polly's wedding dress was made out of mosquito netting, <laughs> and it was donated to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans by daughter Dudley Rulak Groves and her family, who I believe are watching uh, the show virtually now as we speak. Right. Oh, oh, that, oh you, you made it. Oh, wonderful. And here they are right here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What a great thing. And this is still, still there, of course, right? Wonderful. Oh, that's great. Um, do you know where they honeymooned? Gotcha, huh? Very romantic. Fez, Morocco. Couldn't go too far away, right? No Paris going on at that time. OK. So in December 43, the 21st sailed north from North Africa and went up to Naples following the troops. And uh, they started again from scratch, this time no building, this time in a fairground, which is crazy. And it was all done by taking along 3,000 crates of medical equipment that they had acquired while they were in Africa. Again, pouring rain, terribly drenched region, and they basically had to uh, deal with putting up tents and functioning from tents because the buildings had all been bombed out. Staff members had developed extreme fatigue, upper respiratory infections, just as Phil was saying in World War II, and for, excuse me, in World War I. And despite all this, the hospital was functional within days of arrival. This was a very highly motivated group. In January of 44, the Battle of Anzio occurred near Naples. The Allied troops invaded the German positions, and the 21st started getting 300 casualties at a time. Serious, serious injuries. They were subjected to nightly bombing and sounds of anti-aircraft artillery in nearby Naples. In six months, they were again up to a 3,000 bed capacity. Amazing. Then there was a typhus epidemic, and they were asked to control that. And this is why the 21st became known as the best military hospital in Europe during the war. So on the brighter side, on the happier side. My dad played the violin. He loved classical music, as well as helping with the entertainment for the troops. Music was in our soul and around the hospital, he said. Bands played in the wards. Two people who were part of that, Sam Harbison was a surgeon and a violinist. John Patton was a GU surgeon and a piano player. I don't know if any of his relatives, either their relatives are here. Let us know. Uh, 
And then, this is a little bit crazy, at one point they had full co classical concerts, 25-piece orchestra, and it included POWs who had been members of the Phil Berlin Philharmonic. So think about that for a little while, you know? But I think it finally, every, you know, people just wanted to, you know, bring life back to normal a little bit in the midst of all this chaos. The following is a recording of my dad from that archive discussing one particularly exciting experience. Uh, he comes to me one day and he says, hey, Colonel, I, I got a fellow, his name is Heifer or something like that, he plays a fiddle. And the guys over at the airport told me he's just arriving fresh from the United States. What do you think? I said, just bring him by. So I just finished dinner and I was sitting in a lab and in. In walks this guy. Some of you recognize who this is. Uh, others may not recognize who this is. My father probably just about fainted. This is a man who's used to playing Carnegie Hall, playing all over the world, some of the greatest symphony and concert halls of the world. And many have, would say that he is the greatest violinist in the history of the instrument. And this is, of course, Yasha Heifetz. And you can see here, they did a special on, on him, and they called it God's Fiddler. The reason they call Heifetz God's Fiddler is because when he was a young man, he had a teacher uh, who was interviewed, and they said, well, what, how do you teach Heifetz? And he said, I, I can't teach Heifetz anything. And they said, well, so who's going to teach Heifetz? And he said, God. This was a giant. I'm Yasha Heifetz with his accompanist, and... Um, we just sent word out that there was going to be entertainment tonight, and other hospitals were in the air, and uh -huh. they fill the theater, and he was shaking. Hyphus didn't know what the hell to do. I said, just be Hyphus. Just uh -huh. go out there and play. So uh, uh, he played, and uh, they wouldn't let him get off the stage. Uh -huh. They tore the handles off the seats and banged them just to keep them on. And they had dinner with Heifetz afterwards. And here you can see uh, Commander Katie sitting here, Heifetz in the middle, and my dad standing behind Heifetz. One of Heifetz's performances, he did, he did many, many performances uh, during the war all over the world for the, for the military. And one was scheduled in a field on a rain-soaked day. It seemed to be raining all the time for these poor people. And when he got there, there was one lone soldier sitting in the field. And he played, and he did the entire full concert that he would normally do for a large crowd. And later, he was quoted as a saying that this was his single greatest concert ever. June 6, D-Day arrived, Normandy invasion and the start of the French liberation. So the troops now had moved from Naples and were heading to France. They ended up in September in uh, a psychiatric facility near Mirincourt in eastern France. And again, this was not a regular hospital. It was a hosp you know, like a minimalist hospital, and they had to turn it into a full-fledged general hospital. By October, they started admitting. So here we had one month, they started admitting and by November, this is a month later, 3,000 patients were being treated daily. It's just astonishing, absolutely astonishing. And in January, they got over 4,000. So then you might ask yourself, well, what was going on here that they had so many patients occurring in such a short time? And the real question is, where were they in Miracourt? Here's France. Here's Germany. The red line is the border of France and Germany. And here's Miracourt. So my dad had said that, you know, they were in France and, you know, but he, he, I had no idea until I started looking into all this that he was sitting at the German border. 
I had absolutely no idea how close he was to really, really severe fighting. They were 150 miles from Baston, which is between Belgium and Luxembourg, not very far. And does anyone know what happened there? Very good. December 16th, 1944, the Battle of the Bulge, one of the fiercest battles of World War II. They were 150 miles away. And a German Luftwaffe Messerschmitt fighter aircraft was known to cruise at a speed of 400 miles per hour, which basically put them within 30 minutes of Miracourt. Now, despite all the signage, you know, they have big you know, red crosses on top of the hospitals and all that, theoretically you are not you know, supposed to bomb a hospital. You know, but this is war, and then there are also some idiots out there. And one guy, <laughs> despite all of this, came, one German plane came through, scraped the enemy, scraped, scraped the whole area, and one bomb hit the ground. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. In February, the front lines moved into Germany, and they started having fewer patients. They started to draw plans for evacuation, and finally May 8th came. Does anyone know what May 8th was? VE Day, Victory in Europe. And here you see the U.S. troop soldiers uh, being greeted by all the very happy French. In 1945, August 6th and 9th, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed. And it took a little while, but the Japanese finally surrendered. And in September, the general hospital closed down. Here's a shot in front of Miracourt of the officers. I show this to you mainly because I don't think we can ever forget what these people did. Never, ever, ever. And that's the main reason that I'm here. Well, what did they accomplish? 25, 21st over three years, 65,000 patients, 2,200 individuals served over the three-year period, never at one time, 33,000 operations, about a quarter of a million lab tests, 70,000 dental treatments, and 21,000 rehab patients were treated. They received the meritorious service honor, uh, which uh, was a very, very important thing, and this went to the entire staff of the 21st General Hospital. Uh, many of you have heard of the Legion of Merit and the Bronze Star. They are awarded to members of the armed forces for exceptionally meritorious conduct and outstanding service. And this was given to three people in the Barnes system. Colonel Sim F. Beam, Chief of Medical Service. Lieutenant Colonel Harry Agris, Chief of Laboratory Services. And Major Joseph M. Parker, Chief of Orthopedics. And I would like to personally express uh, my attitude and all of, our great, all of our gratitude, rather, to all the veterans and reservists who are with us today and around the country. So where does this leave us after all of this? Uh, many of you have read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, and he talks about three sources of meaning. In work, doing something significant. In love, caring for another person and encouraged during difficult times. So we aren't responsible for whatever circumstances we find ourselves, but we are responsible to respond, and we have a choice in how we respond to those circumstances. And I would say that these principles were totally at the heart of the 21st. How did they do it? They accepted a major challenge, making the best of a very difficult situation. They kept up morale by embracing those things that make life worth living, music, camaraderie, et cetera, and they were insanely stoic. Another quote from my dad. Oh, we just went, uh, we never thought, I don't think we ever thought very much of the dangers of war after a while. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you stop to think about it, we were practically unescorted across the North Atlantic. Uh -huh. If they had sunk our ship, all of the medical personnel that we're talking about would have gone down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we weren't very tuned <laughs> We weren't very tuned in. <laughs> I don't know about that. So they also had to deal with certain moral considerations. Imagine operating on an enemy who may have killed hundreds, if not thousands, of civilians. Imagine if you were a Jewish surgeon and you found out that the man you were operating on committed atrocities at Auschwitz. How did they deal with this? They dealt with it simply with humanism, a total and complete respect for life. 
The staff there were there were there to take care of people, to do their duty, and to not be judgmental. They didn't like to talk about it. They just did it. So here's the 21st General Hospital, an amazing group of individuals, which happened to include one individual, my dad, and they truly were the greatest generation. Thank you very much. <laughs>